All right, also, this is the first Sunday of the month, and so out in our uh, uh, gathering area, across from the coffee, we have a nice prayer wall. Again, that's just a reminder, if you've got some prayers um, that you would like people to pray for, write those on that ticket, um, and then you can post it up on the wall. And when that prayer is answered, go draw a big red heart around it so we know that that prayer was answered. And there are lots of red hearts out there, so that's amazing. Um, yeah. Um, also on that table is for first-time guests. Uh, it, we have just like a little monthly raffle. So there are little cards out there just asking for your name, email, and phone number. And so each month, the first Sunday of the month, we're going to pull a name from that, and you, you get um, some vineyard merch. And so we pulled for the first, our first winner is Caleb Price. I don't know if Caleb's here today, but he's going to win a VCW tumbler and a beanie, which unfortunately we're going to need fairly soon. So... So if you're visiting with us today and haven't filled out a ticket, please do that. It's right across from the coffee area in the gathering room. Uh, yeah, so good morning. Uh, my name's Brett. I serve as the lead pastor here at the Vineyard. I'm glad uh, that we are here this morning together. Um, we're going to be continuing our series called Foundations. Uh, we started this series last month. Um, and we're just exploring the foundational practices that were employed by the early church, the church we read about in Acts, um, and, and what they did um, as a church, a new church, uh, to grow the kingdom. And so in our opening message, if you remember, that was about a month ago, I shared in the opening message that church is a gathering community centered on the practices of Jesus that provides witness to the world about life and God's kingdom, okay? So when we gather together in this place, uh, the church is not the four walls around us. It is the gathering of people seeking the practices of Jesus that will provide a witness of who he is and what it looks like to live in God's kingdom, and so we're breaking down these practices. And so since that opening message, Kayla, the very next week, shared with us the importance of the Lord's Supper, or what we call communion, um, as a practice that builds that community, that strengthens that community, both with one another and in relationship to Jesus. And then two weeks ago, uh, Jesse talked with us about kingdom prayer, and the power that is available when we invite God's kingdom into this community. When we pray uh, th the prayers, let your kingdom come. What happens in, in community. And this morning, we're going to explore the third practice um, that we find kind of mentioned in our key verse, which is from Acts 2, starting in verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That, first, that verse I'm going to repeat is verse 45. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And so over the next few moments, we are going to discuss the practice of being with the least of these, or in vineyard terms, remembering the poor. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity for us to gather as a community to, to hear um, about these practices that are just foundational in being a church community, God. And we just pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive from your word, Lord, but not just for information, but for formation. That we would allow your word to form us um, that these practices that you 
instilled in your early church, Lord, that they would be the practices that we live out in our daily lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I love the book of Acts. Favorite book in the Bible um, is the book of Acts for me. Um, and I really just enjoy this verse 45 because it tells us something really important about how the early church practiced remembering the poor. It says they sold property and possessions. Now this tells me that they did not give to the poor and the needy out of their abundance. They didn't give from the extra cash they had lying around. There were poor people in need, so they sold property and possessions to give to them. They sacrificed for the poor. They gave up something of value for the sake of something they regarded as more important. It says anyone who had a need. What was more important to the church than owning stuff were the poor. It, it reminds me of a story. Um, if you're in, from Tioga County, you know, like in August, about the flooding that happened in the northern part of the county, Westfield, uh, Knoxville, um, Putterbrook, all those areas that just devastating flooding. And, and so um, as that day was unfolding, I got a call and it said, hey, Brad, like, we're going to be transporting people over to the Wellsboro High School. And so, like, the, these people are coming with nothing. Um, like, can the vineyard help in any way? Can you, like, get water or, or food or, or, or anything? We don't know how many people are coming, but, like, there's people that are displaced. And so, you know, I quickly put out a call to, to our, through a fa our Facebook page, I think it was, and uh, maybe a text or email, and, and said, hey, we have an hour to, like, gather water and snacks and, like, meet me in the church in an hour, whoever can do this, and we're going to just take a load up to the school so that as these people arrive, they at least have something to eat and, and something to drink. And, and so um, an hour later, I'm sitting in the parking lot, and I see car after car come in. And then so people would pop open their trunk and there were like a dozen cases of water. And there were boxes of snacks. And it was super cool to see the, uh, the, the um, just church in action and, and, and loving the poor. Um, but interestingly, what really struck me in some instances were some people showed up with what they had in their cupboards. They're like, hey, couldn't get to the store, like, want to help, this is what I had at home. Like, literally taking from their supply and bringing to those in need. That is what the early church did. Here's what I have, I'll give it. I don't have cash, I'll sell this and I'll, and I'll give it to the needy. That is remembering and loving the poor. That is an example of it, what, what it means to be the least of these. And so we're going to take just a little deeper dive into this practice of remembering the poor. And I think it's really important that we start off by defining who are the poor, right? Because in, in our culture, in our context, if I say the word poor, are probably our first thought or our first image goes to the, so, uh, the economically poor, those that simply don't have the finances for uh, the necessities of life. They don't have money for food or rent or clothing or utilities, right? That le is that what you think of when you think of poor, right? Economically depressed, right? But the Bible uses the term poor in multiple ways. Um, economically poor is definitely one of those ways in, in which the Bible talks about the poor. But they also talk about the socially and politically poor, those that were like beggars on the street, uh, those of low social status like shepherds, widows, and orphans were considered 
part of this term, the poor. The Bible talks about the spiritually broken as part of the poor, the disenfranchised, the ones on the fringes of society. All of these, and probably a few more that I missed, uh, are considered the poor from a biblical context. Now, the poor have existed in this world since the fall of mankind in the garden. And the practice of remembering the poor has been around just as long. In fact, if you open the, the front cover of Scripture and you read it through to the end, there is a common theme, many common themes, but a common theme in which God tells his people, remember the poor, love the poor, be with the least of these. It is a thread that is woven through the entirety of Scripture. Deuteronomy 15, verse 7 through 11. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debt is near so that you do not show it ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. All right? Pretty specific, right? Love the poor. If that one in the Old Testament's not enough, Deuteronomy 10, 18, Isaiah 58, 6 through 7, and many more talk about our God's desire for the poor to be loved well. Then if we flip to the New Testament, Jesus, in what is kind of his like opening address to public ministry, says in Luke 4, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. His opening address of his public ministry was, I'm here to love the poor. This is a proclamation of what he is about and what he is bringing to this world, what his ministry will focus on. Eleanor Mumford, who was the former national director of the Vineyard UK, says this um, in regards to the verse in Jesus, it is his manifesto and our mandate. Reading along in the Gospels, Luke 14, it says, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is an echo of a proverb. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. So Jesus cared about the poor. The Old Testament cares about the poor. If we move on after Jesus' ascension into heaven towards the Father, this practice of remembering the poor continues to be commonplace and natural within the early church. Galatians 2.10, all that they ask was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing that we are eager to do, that I have been eager to do all along. James 1, 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted to, by the world. God loves the poor. He has always loved the poor, 
and his command to us is to love the poor, to remember the poor, to spend time with the poor, to be with the poor, serve the poor, meet the needs of the poor, pray for the poor, welcome the poor into the church, and invite them, the poor, into relationship with Jesus. That's always been the plan. We have this, the Vineyard has this cool little booklet. It's called Remember the Poor. If anyone wants to read some more about this topic, I'd love to get your copy. Uh, but in its opening page, it says, um, in the Vineyard, we believe that faithfulness to Jesus means that we are faithful to remember the poor, serve the poor, build community among the poor, and love the poor, compelled by the love of God. That's what the Vineyard as a whole is about. It's a distinctive. As the vineyard here in Wellsboro, I, I think we do a pretty good job with this from an organizational, programmatic perspective. And so what do I mean by that? I think we do a good job with programming that reaches out to the least of these and remembers the poor. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking this week of some of the things that we've done in, in, in recent history. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest things that we did was when, when COVID was like up, shut down, uh, we managed and coordinated giving out meals to families. So like every day for weeks, we would go to the school and pick up meals and meet at the fire hall and cars would come in and we would just pass out meals three or four hours a day for weeks. I think that's loving the poor. Uh, every year we do what we call thanks giveaway, right? People go and they buy everything uh, and needed for a Thanksgiving meal and we pack it in a bag and we invite families to come in and pick it up um, so that they can th provide their Thanksgiving meal for, for their families. Uh, I, I mentioned the flood relief that we just did recently. Uh, we, we send people on missions trips to remember and love the poor abroad. Uh, we do Christmas dinners on Christmas Day for those that are alone, right? Um, and those are all really good opportunities um, that, that the church puts together and makes available for everyone here to serve the poor. And it's so good. Like, it's so good. But the more and more that I think about remembering the poor and I look at the church in Acts, I think there's more to the mandate that Jesus has given us, given us about remembering the poor. I think sometimes... We can get in the habit of treating the poor like projects or programs instead of people. People needing loved, people needing healing, people needing relationship. And so those programs are all good and we won't ever stop doing them. I think what Jesus is calling us to is to be with the poor. Be in relationship with the poor. Actual community with the poor. Uh, David Fitch wrote a book, not related to Deb Fitch, I don't think. Uh, wrote a book, Seven Practices for the Church on Mission. And, and he talks about uh, this idea of, of being in relationship with the poor. And it says... Our relationship with the poor is not to be organized as a program at a local church. Instead, in everyday life, we are to come alongside, be present to the poor in a relationship of family. In this relational space, Jesus becomes especially present. When you did these things to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. I was there. Antagonisms become unwound. Resources are shared back and forth. Healing takes place. Relationships are restored, and a new world is born. This practice of being with the least of these is to characterize our everyday life as Christians, as Christ's church. 
More central to the church life, church's life with the poor is the practice of being with the least of these as part of everyday life. Through history, the church has made its biggest impact when it has practiced being with the poor and resisted turning the poor into a program. The practice of remembering is the poor is to characterize our everyday life as Christians in Christ's church. Programs are great, right? Programs are, are, are great. They do good things. They're a great way for people to get their feet wet into serving the poor, but if we look at the early church, it seems like it was less about programs and more of a way of life that they were intentionally in relationship with those in need. And because of this, we read God added to their number daily, those who were being saved. Matthew 25, verse 31, is a story Jesus tells, kind of about the, the end of uh, uh, days when, when he comes back. Um, he talks about a king coming back and, and separating the, the sheep from the goat. Okay? And so it says in verse 31, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. The practices of being with the least of these should be so commonplace in our daily lives that we are unaware we are doing anything special. Literally, in this story in Matthew 25, those that were separated as righteous were the ones who took care of the poor. And, and, and when Jesus identifies that, it seems that they didn't even know they were doing anything special. Like, when did we do that stuff for you, Jesus? It seems that that was just part of how they lived their life. Loving the poor. And I believe that that's why the early church practiced this. It was mandated by Jesus. They believed that that's what he wanted. And so they just loved the poor. It was just so natural for them to love and take care of the poor. Day in and day out, they spent time with the least of these, and they took care of their needs. Acts 4, 32 through 35 says, All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. It was just commonplace. It was just what they did as the church Jesus had set it up. 
So the question then becomes for us today, <laughs> how do we make that shift, right? How do we make that shift? Like, and I don't have the answer, total answer. But what I think it really begins with, if you want to shift from someone that just serves in a program to someone that is with the poor and loves the poor and intentionally day in and day out lives to serve the poor, I think it begins with compassion. Uh, again, in this Vineyard booklet, talks a little bit about compassion. It says, compassion literally means to suffer with. When we learn to suffer with those in physical distress or economic pain, over time we begin to carry God's heart for the poor. Compassion is learned by doing the work of the kingdom, the work of serving the poor. We need to have compassionate hearts for the poor. Like that's where it starts. But a compassionate heart without action doesn't do anything. So we need to ask for compassionate hearts towards the poor, and then we need to take some steps, some action towards them. And yes, for some, re for some, that's just serving in a program of the church. That's why they're important. It's getting your feet wet in serving the poor in some outreach. But it shouldn't stop at that. It should propel you into things like volunteering at organizations that serve the poor on a regular basis, like the Tyler County Homeless Initiative or, or Diapers for Darlings or, or, or any number of organizations that we have available in this county. And it also means that we intentionally train our mind day in and day out to see the poor and respond to the poor. And so as the worship team comes up this morning, what time are we at? Oh, let's pause for just a moment. Is that time really right? Okay. Can we play it? All right. So I had a video and I said to Jenna, I'm really long-winded, um, I know that, and so I have like a seven, eight minute video that I think is incredible, and I'm like, I really wanna play it, but I also am long-winded. And so it's a seven or eight minute video that we're gonna play and, and give you some context. This is actually um, a portion of a message that was uh, presented by Eleanor Muff Mumford, who is the former Vineyard UK National Director. Uh, she did this at the 2015 Global Vineyard Conference where she was discussing the distinctives of the vineyard, things that made the vineyard distinct. And, and she'll talk about a, a couple of them within this, but she does just an incredible, incredible, like, piece on remembering the poor. And so, Jesus, videos don't always work good here, so <laughs> let this video work. So this is Eleanor Mumford talking about remembering the poor. All across the world, that the more care we take for the poor, the more favor that we show the poor, the more the Lord loves it and the more he blesses us. They must always come first. And it's always been precious. And I know that John and Carol used to say in the early days, we remember the poor, the poor come first, and God will bless the rest. And sure enough, it is true. Because we follow our hero, we follow our Jesus. And he said the first words of his public ministry when he preached, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It was his manifesto, it's our mandate. We are the direct descendants of him, the disciples, the 120, those gathered in the upper room, all the ones with whom he shared his authority. We are their direct descendants. We are the immediate inheritors of that authority, of that anointing. And that's why we go to the poor, and that's why we rescue men and women, and that's why we seek their welfare before all else. We have a wonderful church. 
They have a sweet church in the north of England. And very early on, they decided they were going to put the poor front and central in the work that they did. And there were a group of them praying as they started to develop their compassion ministry. They prayed and they asked the Lord what they should do. And they felt that he said to them, I want you to start buying and collecting bedding. Bedding. So they thought, okay. And they asked the Lord for a little bit more instruction. And he said, I want you to buy 14 sets of bedding. Duvet covers, comforters, I don't know what you call them, sheets, pillowcases. So they did. They bought 14 sets of bedding. And then they went down to a local hostel where they had befriended a woman and said, is there anything we might do to help you? And the woman in charge said, well, what we really do need at the moment is bedding. And they said, well, we think you, we could help you with that. How much would you like? And she said, well, I'm afraid we actually need enough bedding for 14 beds. 14 beds. And when they produced 14 sets of brand new bedding, the woman in charge turned to them and she said, are you people psychic? <laughs> no, but we do have a Lord who speaks to us and who loves the poor, who has compassion on those who haven't got bedding to sleep on. A heavily pregnant woman was hospitalized in one part of the country after a violent attack by her husband. The police relocated her to a town many miles away. In that town, in the street, she met a woman from the vineyard who befriended her and brought her to church. I heard her say this, and it reduced me to tears. She said, I moved here for my own safety. I found this church. I read the little book called Why Jesus? And I have never looked back as she went down the steps into the baptismal waters. God loves when we care for the poor. I have a wonderful story which I share of my friends in a vineyard in the west of Norway. And there was a girl in their church who'd been to one of their healing classes because she's the beauty of the vineyard. The thing that we loved at the very beginning was that we were told that we could learn to do this. We could learn to do it. Jesus taught his disciples. Then he let them do it. He watched them. He sent them out. We can do this. We can train our people to become increasingly proficient at caring for the sick and praying for healing. So this girl had been to one of their little groups, and she wrote this. She said, I was on my way home from Bible school, and as I got on the bus, I noticed a girl there that I hadn't seen in over 10 years. I didn't know what to say to her, but she made room for me beside her, and I thought I'd better sit down by her. She had a baby, and so I said to her, is it fun to have a baby? And she said, no. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I'm reading this verbatim, it's so sweet. I thought to myself, I should never have asked her that question, and I should never have taken this seat. But the young mother started to tell about how difficult life had been for her. She had once been a part of the church. She'd gone away from the church. She had a boyfriend. She'd found herself with child. Her mother insisted she had an abortion, but God bless her, she refused. She had her baby, and as she gave birth to her baby, when her mother saw her grandchild, she continued to say she should have had an abortion because the child looked so ugly. The baby was born with an open, cleft lip. As she said, I could clearly see. I felt so sorry for her, and I knew God was asking me to pray for her, as I'd been taught at the vineyard, and I felt more and more embarrassed, and I got annoyed arguing with God. Imagine that. God, she said, I'm not interested in praying here on this bus. This is so embarrassing. This is a small city. Everyone knows each other. It's not going to happen anyway. Oh, isn't it real? So I leaned towards her, asking in a tiny, small voice, is it okay if I pray? I made myself as little as I could. I'm reading. And with a very quiet voice and speaking very fast, afraid that people in the bus might hear me, God, will you please interfere in this situation? It's <laughs> a good prayer. Would you interfere? I looked down at the baby, and there, the open lip had disappeared. There was no sign. No sign. No sign of what was there before. It gets better. The lip was perfectly normal. I screamed. The mother cried. I thought, I am insane. This is not possible. I checked the baby's lip. I couldn't believe what had just happened. The mother screamed. She didn't understand anything. We cried. I got her cell number. 
A little later, she called me and told me that she'd been back to the hospital. And what I didn't know was the baby's heart was in serious condition. Its lungs didn't work as they should. Its kidneys were in extremely bad condition. Its urine had a strange color. And test after test, the baby got better and better. And when the mother traveled to the main hospital in Oslo and the baby was re-examined, they said, this is impossible. The baby in your arms is different from the baby on our records. The baby in our records needed extremely much help not to die, but the baby you are holding is 100% well. <laughs> and why I love why I love that story and why I tell it, she was so ordinary, she was so shy, she was so frightened, she was so unsure, her faith was so low, but because she loved Jesus, she obeyed his commandments and God came in and did the rest. It's a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing. We know of two remarkable young women who are pediatric doctors and they have started a work among children in a very, very impoverished area of India in Orissa. And recently, they had terrible rains. They've actually planted a church by mistake. So many people are coming to Jesus and they all want to be part of the vineyard that they found themselves leading a vineyard almost without trying. I mean, it's amazing what's going on there. However, one of the ways their compassion was demonstrated was recently there was so much rain and so much flooding that they were the ones who went to all the homes around the compound, and around the area, to offer help and assistance because they were the only two who could swim. They swam. They swam. And they took the help that those people needed. We have a church in the northwest of Ireland Causeway Coast Vineyard, just over two and a half thousand people came to faith there in 2014, and 1,300 more this year, in the streets, in the schools, in the workplaces, in the local town. And the pastor was asked, is this revival? You could be forgiven for asking. And he said, no, but it is what happens when Christians do what Christians are supposed to do. It's just a small, small snippet, uh, but uh, and the worship team can come up. Um, yeah, but I want you to think about those stories and think about what Eleanor just said. That's what happens when Christians do what they're supposed to do. When we remember the poor as Jesus commanded and instructed, he breaks out. He does amazing things. And so I'm going to go ahead and invite you to stand. And we're going to go into our time of worship and ministry.